oftentimes fungi, we might think of something that looks like this, right? You got the cap and the stalk and those gills underneath. But we'll look at a lot of really wild looking mushrooms as well as other fungi that I think are pretty mind blowing. Fungi are responsible for breaking down leaf matter in the fall through the winter. So typically, you know, like out in our forest, maybe at home you rake the leaves and you bag them and you get rid of them. But out in the forest, nobody's raking them and getting rid of them, right? And they kind of go away by the summer. I've been wondering this for like years now. Yeah. I just never really remember to Google. I just never really remember to Google it. Yeah. Cause like I was like every year for some reason again I go like maybe I should pick up all those leaves in my backyard because they're not here when the snow is gone and then I forget that they disappear and then I stop thinking about it. Right. Yeah. And it's it's a good thing. So my neighbor is always mad at me because my natural prairie I have in the front it looks ugly. The majority of the year she calls it ugly because she has a very manicured garden she buys the plants and makes little rows and it looks all perfect hey, was beautiful. yeah so she's always going oh, why don't you get rid of the leaves and i i cut all of my prairie plants at the stems and then i just pile them because it helps animals to have warm places to live but also what i'm doing is that the matter, all of this plant matter, will get broken down by fungi and bacteria, the, the um, decomposers, and they're gonna take those nutrients and put them into the soil. So that in the spring, I've got a lot of really good conditions for them to grow back up. I've got a lot of nutrients, and then water comes, warm temperature, sunlight, and the nutrient part is really important. So if, you know, she always like rakes all of her leaves away. And I say, no, 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 leave the leaves because it's going to enrich your soil. Oh, uh, no, it's ugly. But you want that. Is that going to happen still or as much if you have grass or only if it's just like, like exposed soil? No, it'll, ha it'll happen. They'll, they'll do it on top of grass so that it will like give nutrients to the grass too. Okay. I know just like a lot of towns will say like you have to rake your leaves when when we should really just leave them leave leave them i get it <laughs> you know where tar terms come from other places right all right so key features about you looked at some of this under the microscope you saw things like this underneath the microscope Fungi are multicellular, but to see their features better, we look under the microscope, so they are multicellular. The whole mass of a fungus, like the mushroom, it is mycelium. When you looked under the microscope, you saw that the mycelium was made of all these lines. All of these lines are the hyphae, or hyphae, however you want to say it. So it's kind of like this, like my, my dress here, this, the dress itself is the mycelium. If I look at the dress under the microscope, I see individual threads. The individual threads are the hyphae. So it's like you see this whole mass thing, right? And then the individual little threads are the hyphae. So again, you look under the microscope, you, you, know, you see this mushroom and then under the microscope, you might start seeing lines, and then you see finer lines, the higher the power is. Remembering that when you look under a microscope, the ocular has a 10x power, and then each of the objectives or the lenses have whatever power they are. So you always, when you're, to, to, you're looking at total magnification, it's 10 times the objective. So like the scanner was 4x, 10 times 4x, it blows it up 40x. The high power, 10 times 43x is 430x. So I think if microscopes, if you're like, mm, I'm so boring, microscopes are pretty cool because they have this magical power that they can blow things up really large. And you see these details. If you, if I had that magical power and I could make you 430 times bigger, would that be impressive? 
you probably wouldn't fit in this room anymore, right? So that's one of the cool things about microscopes. And if we had a really, really strong microscope, we would be able to see that the hyphae are made up of cell walls, and that in the cell walls, they have these little pores. And what fungus do is the way that fungus undergo digestion and get their nutrients is that they grow on something that's dead or um, the waste of something else. And then they release enzymes and acids outside of their body, so the things that happen in our stomach. They, they release it outside of their body onto the thing that they want to consume. And then they let that stuff do its magic. And then they suck it back up when it's digested outside of their body. So it's kind of like if you were to throw up on a piece of pizza and then you just like wait for it to digest and then you just like absorbed it back through your skin. Really gross. But that's the way they do it, is that they do that outside secretion of all that stuff. And then through the pores in their cell walls, they absorb it. So not only do plants have cell walls, but fungus have cell walls too, and that's one of the things that gives them very strong structure or makes a lot of the mushrooms and other fungus very like rubbery and gives them strength in their composition is because they have those cell walls. And again, they are eating dead things and waste. So it's so important to have them. Otherwise, there'd just be dead things and the waste of living things piled up everywhere. But thankfully, they get rid of it. That was a little carboniferous to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good thing, right? Um, we'll also talk about some of them feed directly on living things. Some of them cause diseases or parasites. And some of them, like the lichen that you looked at, has a symbiotic relationship with something else. Okay, so they can reproduce sexually and asexually. They will reproduce through spores. I love these pictures here because you can see, now again, these would be microscopic here and they would be puffing this out. So the, what they're, the spores that they're puffing, you can't see that in the air. Isn't that cool? So that's why um, I have a, a spore allergy, the mold spore allergy. So usually in like late spring, even summer, I just get, I get that summer cold or I get that fall cold when everybody else, nobody else is sick and I'm like getting this and it feels like a cold, but I know exactly what it is. It's that my allergy to the spores, the mold spores in the air. You can't see this stuff. How did you realize you were allergic to that? Because it happens always, like every year around the same time, especially if it's really rainy, that will like fuel the, um, the molds to have like a better condition to break down stuff. And then I just get, I get that cold. Yeah, there's, um, and it's usually when uh, outside of flu, flu season. I mean, that's my hypothesis. I don't know for sure, for sure, but. They have fruiting bodies, so the body, kind of outside of the spore thing, the body itself is what we call the fruiting body. Can be the form of a mushroom, but again, we'll see different forms as well. And mushrooms can be like these cute little cup fungi, fungi or uh, morels, which are very expensive mushrooms. You can go hunt for them in the forest preserves. You can look up when to hunt for them, but also they tend to look also like a, um, a poisonous mushroom, so you have to be really careful. Mushrooms in general, um, edible mushrooms, if you're ever like, I'm gonna go hunting, because I could, you can make some good money off of it, but if you poison someone by giving them the wrong one, like if you're like, here, I'm gonna sell you this one, and then they die, well, you're in a lot of trouble, right? So you have, to, you have to be really educated about what 
mushrooms look like before you get into that whole mushroom field. If a really strong fungicide is released and eliminates all the fungi in an ecosystem, which of the following is likely to happen? I think these are readable words. eliminate the fungi. No fungi. Would it improve the growth of plant species? No. Would it, if they're not around, would it be faster breakdown of leaf litter? No, it'd be slower, right? Would there be an accumulation of dead and discarded plants and animal tissue? I think it's all going to pile up, right? Would it improve the soil fertility? No, it's going to do the opposite. And well, this doesn't even have anything to do with photosynthesis aside from just the fact that we're looking at like these two that plants rely on the fungi. So the opposite would be true on these. But okay, so yeah, C is the best answer. Remember this under the microscope. When you looked at it under the microscope, what you saw was the, the algae or the photosynthetic bacteria. It was reddish and the fungi itself was greenish. So here's what it really looks like. The dots would be some kind of photosynthetic algae or bacteria, and the fungi might be whatever, you know, like maybe a brownish here. This one is kind of clearish. And the two of them together live in a symbiotic relationship to form what's called lichen. The CH is a K sound, lichen, not lichen, lichen. So together what happens is, is that the fungus gives a protective home to this photosynthesizer and in return, and also gives the photosynthesizer carbon dioxide from the breakdown of its food. And in return, the photosynthetic algae or bacteria will give some sugars and other foods to the lichen, as well as provide with oxygen. So they have this nice little relationship. Here you can see in my picture, this is one I, I took myself, because when I see things like this out in nature, I'm like, ooh, there's a different kind of lichen that I've ever seen before. Let me take a picture. And so here you can see it's kind of whitish, the fungi, and underneath the skin you can see the darker areas that have that photosynthesizer inside. You'll find them on logs, growing on trees, um, any, sometimes even rocks, you'll just see them growing on a rock together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now that you know what it looks like when you go out into the world, if you go for a hike, you'll be like, oh yeah, there's lichen. How about that? I always think this is interesting. When you have this kind of symbiotic relationship, it is so beneficial. I know we talked about this with evolution, the endosymbiont theory when you have that big predatory bacteria or prokaryote, I should say, and it gave the housing to the chloroplast-like bacteria. 90%, look at that, 90% of its energy needs are fulfilled by the photosynthesizer living inside. Oh, like especially food so expensive right now, wouldn't it be great to have something in you that provided 90% of your energy needs and you didn't have to buy 90% or spend 90% of the food that you needed and you'd get oxygen, you'd always be like well oxygenated and you'd have food and it would be, all you had to do is give it a home. You know what this is almost exactly like? It, it feels like a terrestrial version of like coral reef system. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Coral, coral reefs that like the, um they're actually like the little polyps, the individual animals, and they get like they actually also get like ninety percent of their True. from from and the bleaching of the coral reef is not like the coral like immediately dying and sit expelling that. Um, You're spoiling my next part <laughs> of the produce, so we will get to that. Yeah, good. Thank you. That's a that's a good uh, analogy there. This is called mycorrhiza, Mike or rise up, mycorrhiza. Yeah, it's one of those big words. I had to listen to it a bunch of times. I'm like, how do I say this? 
mycorrhiza, very similar here, is that you have a symbiotic relationship going on between fungus and the roots of a plant, and the fungus is going to absorb water from dry soil. Uh, typically, most plants have this relationship, which is great, but it will be even more significant when you're talking about desert plants where it's really, really dry. And so the fungus is gonna be extremely important in supplementing water to those desert plants. There's fungus in the desert. Yeah, there's fungus. Anywhere things die and there's waste, there's fungus. I don't know why I didn't think of uh, that's actually, Yeah. This actually explains when I, when I, when, when I transplanted like my, um, my cacti and succulents um, in, into like sandboxes that I had, like it was sandpots I had them in. Um, when I, when I like, um, cause I always, cause they, they're always like sold in like potting soil and I like to put mine in sand and they really love the sand cause they always flower when I put them in sand. Um, um, when I, when I like bring all the soil, like um, all through, when I like free the roots and bust them in the sand, I realize like I'm, the, the roots do look like this, they look like kind of fuzzy. So they yeah. Really fungus. Yeah, they'll actually be bulbous and, and might even be fuzzy because the fungus are sticking out. Yeah. Is there anything like in the ocean that does the same job? Um, or like in the ocean, like for the dead stuff? And oh yeah, yeah, there's, there's uh, bacteria and or fungus that live, I mean, everywhere, everywhere. It's gotta get rid of, there's gotta be things that get rid of the death and the waste, yeah. So, you know, it's another interesting thing when we say like, oh, we have to save the earth, we gotta save the planet. Like, no, the planet's gonna be fine. The planet's gonna, want, if humans, it's like, again, it's like the humans, we gotta learn how to save ourselves and live with nature. We have to be symbiotic in, in nature, uh, that, is going to be a really important thing for you all as you go into your different careers to think about that. Even if you're like, I'm going to be a PA or a dentist, you need to really start thinking about your environment and all the waste that you create and what you can do to better make that happen. So if it's a simple thing like buying gloves that are made of like a corn base as opposed to something that doesn't break down for thousands of years is a good thing to start thinking about and supporting companies that have materials in your workplace that are better for the earth and as more people if, just think about like if every medical professional started to use gloves because usually gloves what they don't keep them on all day it's like a one right treat a patient don't wear the gloves do you need them to be like super duper strong to the point where they last a thousand years. No, you need them to last like maybe 10 minutes to a couple hours. So if you have something that is like corn-based, that is biodegradable, it just needs to be thick enough so that you don't like have contact with that person. And just think if every medical place in the world used something that's a biodegradable type of glove, how much better the environment would be. And it takes a lot of, I always, I always used to say like McDonald's, for example, when I was a kid, McDonald's used to serve real food. Now there's a lot of chemicals in the food. There's a whole science behind the way things taste. <coughs> that there are chemicals, they put chemicals to make you crave their french fries. It's a lot different. Like I taste a McDonald's french fry and I'll be like, gross. It doesn't taste right to me. It doesn't taste like real food. So, um, if, if we all said, hey, McDonald's, we're not gonna eat your food until you make it more sustainable, less chemical, healthier for us. If everybody stopped going there and demanded that, would McDonald's be like, no, we're gonna keep making this food for nobody? No, would they change? So that's the thing about all of us, is that this like kind of group source, crowdsourcing of fighting for what's right is really, really important. And it's a lot easier with social media. So think about that in terms of being an influencer, is that if you could really influence change for people to make people's lives better would be really important. So I got off on a really long tangent. So let's go back to fungus. All right, so fungi, 
do a very similar thing, absorption of water here. Uh, this is also why like, if you have a plant um, and you don't water it for a long time, this is one of the reasons why they can survive for quite a long time. Because moisture in the air does go into some of the soil and that fungus will help that plant to survive. I lived in a house for three years and on the back porch there was a plant that I thought was fake. I didn't water it for three years and I was cleaning it out and I was like, let me take this ugly fake plant down. It was real. I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't watered that since I moved in. So, mycorrhiza for you. Again, it's very similar to what we talked about with the lichen, is that the fungus will absorb water, hand that over to the plant. The plant will give it a nice little home. In return, the plant sugars that are released at the roots will feed the fungus, and they have this nice little happy release. Okay, that actually explains things now. I had a succulent that I actually got from horticulture, and I was taking good care of it, but like it, like it died on me, and um, so like so I like I get it. I guess I should say it died, and I it like it slowly started to shrivel until it only had like a few like it only had like the very center like the very base of the stem had like just the like the slightest like touch of green on it where I could tell like it's still alive, but it's like it on its last legs, and then I actually didn't water it for like months. And then, um, I, and then I'm, I'm, and then when I was putting my succulent box together, I'm like, you know what? What the heck? I'll, uh, it's, it is. It, I can tell it's alive. It has like, it, 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 I can barely see like the size of the green. Or right, it's a speck of green on this plant. So like, came back, there, right? And I realized the reason why it was dying on me, even though I was taking good care of it, because it was it, because the roots were restrained. It had one of those like, um, th those like black fabric like, wrappings around the yeah. roots that was like really restrained. So I actually freed the roots and I and I stuck it in sand and right now it's like it's actually like really big and it, it, it it's even flowered twice already. So it, like yeah, plants are really resilient. So I guess I guess I, I I I've been wondering why I was able to live without me wa watering it for months. I guess it has something to do with the fungus where yeah. it was able to like yeah, hang I'm out sure it had that that important relationship. Yeah, yeah. So what? So I'm a little lost on what exactly the mycorrhiza is, like what it is. It's a, it's a symbiotic relationship between it's, it's the, a fungus and a plant. Okay, so mycorrhizae is the name, the name of the relationship that they have? Yes. Okay. Yes. Same with lichen. Lichen is the, the two organisms in a relationship. So it encompasses mycorrhiza or lichen encompasses both of those. But they are, there are two organisms within mycorrhiza or two organisms within, it could be even mycorrhiza, could be more than two. Um, and same with the lichen, but they're the sim it, it symbolizes the symbiosis there. Okay. Do you remember this? What tube transports sugar down through the plant to the roots? Yeah. Which one is it? The flow. The phloem. Phloem. Right? Flowing downward. Flow. Flowing down. Sugar is flowing down. Penicillium. Penicillium, see how I got this in italics? This is a genus name. So penicillium, if you were writing it like on your lab, a lot of you wrote penicillin is a mold. But penicillin is not the mold. Penicillium is the mold that produces the antibiotic penicillin. Very close names, penicillium, is the genus name, penicillin, is the antibiotic that is produced. So when you have oranges, I come home, I bought a bag of cuties, and in the bottom there's one that had that kind of like green little cap on it, that dusty green cap, that is penicillium producing that antibiotic. This is all discovered totally by accident. Read about it, Fleming. Um, very interesting that is growing bacteria and then this turned up on the plate and he went well, what is this this is interesting that the on the plate nothing no bacteria is growing near this weird green white thing and then he started to experiment more and figured out oh this kills bacteria 
and figured out the first antibiotic. It also grows on orange, so I, I also, I, as I mentioned, grows on oranges, it looks kind of like this. Or if you like any of the, the blue cheeses, the moldy cheeses, you're eating penicillin, penicillium. Can you eat that orange? Uh, I mean, you could, it's not gonna taste good. But well, it wouldn't hurt you? No, it, it, but usually it's like inside, it's starting to actually digest, oh. um, starting to break down. So um, when these oranges, if you pick them up, they're usually kind of like mushy. Um, I wouldn't suggest eating it regardless. Um, did you, did you my face? Oh, I was yeah. gonna ask the same question. Okay, <laughs> if you have. That's like the one question I have for everything. Can I eat it? <laughs> <laughs> if you have a bacterial infection, like um, syphilis, for example, is treated with penicillin. If you think you have syphilis, you're like, oh, I got all these symptoms. I'm just gonna eat this. It is not a treatment. It has to be processed in a way to become the penicillin that we know today. So nothing would happen if we eat that, right? What? Nothing would happen to us if we eat it. Maybe you'll get enough to tell me though, because the orange is no bueno anymore. Yeah, I, it's mushy now. It just doesn't look like something that I would eat. The other thing too is that it, it, it does contain the antibiotic. Um, it could have an effect on your microbiome. So it's just like this is yummy to eat, but should you eat like a pound of it? Probably not. It's probably not something that has a fungus growing on it. So you obviously have to like they when they. Yeah, I know where you're going. When they like produce penicillin, how do they, it's like all naturally, it's not anything? Yes, like, so it starts from a, a, it starts from a natural source and then they, they manufacture chemically to produce like the penicillin in the pills or maybe like if you're in the hospital and they put it in uh, drip form, but they do something to make sure that it's like, what you need, as opposed to this might not be exactly what you need. So like that wouldn't be, that's obvious, like that wouldn't be, I'm just trying to, like say you have a pill of penicillin. Right, it would be this like, com it would be this compacted with chemicals basically, right. to become the pill form. I mean certainly if there were a uh, uh, apocalypse and we didn't have the ability to chemically process this. Oh wow. And you had some kind of bacterial infection, this might be a good thing to either like put on that bacterial infection or consume to see if it helped us, but <coughs> we're not in an apocalypse, right? So we get the little pill from the doctors and the right amount. We also, you don't know dosing wise. You don't know what the dose is here. So how much should you take is another important thing. I know, interesting. Interesting stuff. Yeast. Um, yeast produce yummy things like bread, and then also wine and beer. Bread. <laughs> Different kinds of bread all over the world that use yeast for them. Yeast produce these things by fermentation. And so remember, we talked a little bit about fermentation. How fermentation is a kind of cellular respiration that produces less ATP per the food that it is that it makes, uh, that it breaks down, excuse me, but produces a not good side effect in animals, in our muscles, we produce lactic acid, and it can produce alcohol. Now you think, well, wait, you just said it's not a good thing, but it's not a good thing for the yeast because the yeast, as they undergo fermentation, It'll keep them going for a while, but eventually if they're in water and they're producing alcohol, what happens when you or a human, maybe I know a lot of you don't drink, but a human drinks too much alcohol, do they feel good? <laughs> for a minute, yeah, okay, for, for a little bit, you feel good. Okay, the next day, do you feel good usually? Okay, so there's a bunch of things, right? Alcohol will start to leach nutrients from our cells. What else does it leach from our cells as we consume it? Water. Water. 
So we get dehydrated and we lose a lot of nutrients and then we feel, ugh, right? Call it a hangover. That the yeast will get not only just hungover, but they'll get so dehydrated that the alcohol will kill them. So what do we do? We manipulate them to make alcohol so that we can produce bread, wine, and beer, and then we murder these little things in the process. So when you are eating bread, wine, and beer, you've murdered another organism to get your yummy thing that you want. But we murder things all day, right? You're eating all kinds of stuff. Murders. Wow. They're cat-throwing fungus, and they make little hats. What do you think is inside of their hats? Um, spores. What? Spores, yeah. So they have all these little spores that start to build up inside of them. They have a lot of water inside of their body. They look great. Yeah, they, they do. <laughs> they make these little, they take the water and the spores go to the top with a bunch of water inside. And eventually what happens is that the water pressure gets so high that poof, and their little hats explode. I know, millions. One of them will produce millions of spores at the same time. Millions, they call it puffing. You can sometimes see these, they're really small, like maybe a centimeter or even millimeters. They'll be growing on oftentimes the logs. You might see a colony of them. And um, if, you, if you go and you blow on them, that action, just that little bit of pressure from blowing on them or puffing at them, they call it puffing, will cause them to all go and explode their little heads. Do they live after they explode or do they? Yeah. They can they just they like, make some more? Yep, yeah, they just do it all over again. Okay. Yeah. So you don't have to feel like a murderer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what happens is, is that um, oftentimes not only do they live on dead things, like I mentioned logs, but also they will grow in feces or dung of elk. Okay, so here's, here's the thing, is that they will grow up on there and what they want to do is they want to, and this is what happens with a lot of fruit and the reason why, I, I guess I never talked about fruiting, the point of it, was that fruit wants to get consumed. Sometimes the seeds want to get, I mean, I shouldn't say want, need to get consumed by another organism. So like a peach pit. Inside of the pit, or a plum pit, it's pretty thick and the organism is inside of there. And to break down that pit so that it can release the embryo from inside and grow is that the peach wants to get eaten by, let's say like this, like an elk. So very similar strategy here, whether we're talking about the Palabolus or the peach pit. And so that they can go through the digestive system of an organism that has a lot of acids and digestive materials, enzymes, and it'll weaken that outer barrier of whether we're talking about the outer barrier of the spore or the outer barrier of like a pit. And then they get pooped out with the feces. But here's the thing, is that feces has a lot of nutrients still in it. And if you are like a fungus or a plant, you know, like if you had to live in a pile of poop, it would be disgusting. But for them, they're like, woo, this is awesome. There's all kinds of nutrients and it's moist and these are great conditions for me to grow in. So it's ideal for them to go through that. They need to go through the digestive system of something. They need to get eaten and then grow in poop. And that's the way their lives go. <laughs> That's what is ideal situation. This is their natural selection process. So they have to go through that digestive system to get weakened. The outer portion gets weaker so that when 
They are pooped out. They're ready to grow. Take all those nutrients that are left over that the elk here didn't utilize. But now to make a new generation, they've got to get their spores to a place that will get eaten by another elk. But elks don't eat their own poop. So their calf, it's really interesting that the calf, the actual head, has phototropism. Remember like auxins, one of the characteristics of the hormone auxin in plants is to get the plant to lean toward the sun or grow toward the sun. They have a phototropic ability too, or uh, behavior, so that they tilt toward the sun. And the idea is that if you are tilting your head toward the sun and exploding this high pressure situation of your spores, the sun grows what? Grass or other things that elks would eat. So you have to go through the digestive system, grow in the poop, and then get your spores over to the grass. And so that's why, for example, here, they're facing their little heads phototropically, I don't know if that's a real word, but toward, they're aiming toward the sun without even knowing like, it's some kind of hormonal response to lean toward the sun, just like plants do. Amazing, right? They don't have a brain. How do they do this? How do organisms, this is the behaviors that are coded for in their DNA. These are traits that are going to be really important. So that if you have one that doesn't, they have a defective gene for this phototropism, and they're just like shooting straight up in the air, they're not gonna, sur they're not gonna survive, nor are their spores going to go to the right place. So here's natural selection in action, is that the ones that have the genes should just do this simple behavior of leaning toward the sun so that their spores go and land on plants. They are selected for by having that behavior. Yeah, Jay. Uh, I know you said like you can eat a little one though because it doesn't go pop a spore. Are there any like downsides like breathing those spores in or is it? Uh, I mean, if you have a, a allergic situation to it then yeah and you certainly don't want to like you you don't want to be like this and they're all coming right into your respiratory system right so you'd probably want it if you were going to do it the other thing is like you can also usually just a little touch will do it as well but you'll get it on your finger and then you don't want to like rub it into your eye yeah so p potentially hypothetically could be yeah, yeah good question so hypothetically, if I kind of maybe ate grass when I was little because I wanted to see how it tasted, and I ate this kind of fungus, theoretically, <laughs> would I poop it out and it would just be living in my digestive tract? Yeah. Oh, whoa. But you you probably didn't go and poop in your yard. Nope. Right? Like so, it goes Definitely through. Definitely not. It goes through a system that goes out to Stickney, where it goes into that big processing plant. So. <laughs> maybe there's mushrooms in the process. Yeah. All right, from your eating grass. All right. So like this one, you know, this one in this illustration, I, I found this on the internet and I thought, oh, this is not, you know, that really they would be like puffing this way and this wouldn't be a selected for behavior. The leaning would make it go toward the grass. So I, yeah, I just put that in there for that. Okay, so now let's get to the real dirty one. The parasites. How do you know that this is? Okay, we're gonna get back to this in a second. Whoa. If you're watching the sum of us and you're and or played the game, cordyceps. <laughs> cordyceps are a group of fungi that control insect growth. For they control the insects from overpopulating the earth. They keep them, and there's a lot of different species of cordyceps out there. So you can see like this, the spores are like little tiny darts. And so an insect will get that little tiny dart in them, and then that one little spore will start to replicate and begin to eat it from the inside, but also control their brains. 
so that the insects will go toward and find the largest colony and plant themselves in the middle of the colony so that they can now infect as many insects as possible. <laughs> How does this one little fungus do this to control the insect world? Okay, we'll get back to, we'll, I'll show you a video at the end of that. Uh, arthrobotters. Here's a hyphae that are shaped like rings. And what they capture in their rings is that you have these nematodes, which don't feel so bad for this little worm because often they are parasites themselves. So we have, again, the control of something with something else. The fungus is controlling this other kind of parasite with these traps. Their hyphae are shaped like traps. And so when the nematode swims through this circle, it stimulates these to cuff up and then really clamp on to the nematode. And there's all different species of arthrobotters. So there's not just one type. And the species of arthrobotter will be specific to the species of nematode. So for example, this one is only going to work with this kind of nematode. You can see another like ring here. Here's a different species of arthrobotters. This one just makes loop after loop after loop after loop after loop. And they do also, they can, some of them also will, um, upon stimulation of going through the ring and then puffing up, they'll release spores inside of the body like little harpoons, so like injection. And so then it starts to digest them from the inside out, like the cordyceps. And here's another species. Some of them may, arthropoders may just shoot harpoons from movement. This is typically happening in watery environments. And so if they feel water, they feel the water start to move, they'll be like pew, 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 and they'll start shooting harpoons out from water movement. And then hopefully that harpoon gets into a nematode that they're going to then infect. And again, another species, another two different species. So there's so many different kinds of that in the world. Which of the following is a job that is not performed by any fungus? Are they decomposers? Yes. Yeah, so that is a job. Okay, are they parasites? Yes. Yeah. Are they predators? Um, kind of, yes. Yeah, uh-huh. Are, are fungus producers? Are they sometimes in a symbiotic relationship with a producer? Okay, so no, they are not producers themselves, but they can be in symbiotic relationships. So remember that. And are they pathogenic? God, yeah, do they cause diseases? That's what pathogenic means, which we'll get to if you didn't know the definition of that yet. Yeah. So kind of interesting that you gotta really think about this. So why are there, so can you define producer again? Producer produces energy within the cells of their body. Okay. So like, Sometimes the words are so great, right? So like photosynthesizers pretty much. Photosynthesizers like, are producers. You think like bottom of the food chain pretty much. Well, we're top or mid, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I know. It's, I like want to say food. yes because we love food, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, these are called chytrids. The CH is a K sound. Chytrids. They will often grow in waters around the world. So they are, remember, aquatic means grows in water. So if you don't remember what aquatic means, you might want to write like grows in water. They've been around for a really long, long, long time. They have been linked to massive frog and amphibian die-offs around the world. Amphibians do not have very well developed lungs, if you remember that from when we talked about evolution. And so they supplementally breathe through their skin. 
And in breathing through their skin, one of the things about amphibians is that they're often called environmental indicators because that breathing through their skin, it enhances the ability to take in not only oxygen, but toxins in the environment. And so that they will be affected quicker than other organisms are. The chytrids can be in water and then their skin breathing and the amphibians being tied to water makes them more susceptible to chytrids. So that's one other one. Okay, ergots. Ergots, um, this particular species, Claviceps propia, it causes ergot. Ergot is a disease of cereal crops. Rye, especially, is very susceptible to having that ergot disease. Ergots, if they are consumed, can be linked to disease or toxicity in humans and other animals. This is getting to be a bigger and bigger problem around the world. All right, so if you had consumed that particular species that causes ergot, some of the characteristics that, or symptoms that you would experience are convulsions, meaning that your muscles are contracting really quickly, hallucination, you're seeing things that aren't really there, gangrene, which is a rotting basically of your flesh at the extremities typically, um, and, and cattle, now think about cattle who are eating grasses, if they're eating grasses that have that species that causes ergot, they, one of the key things that farmers are looking for is that if like suddenly their milk production and their cows goes way down, or if the cows are acting like crazy or shaking. Okay, so um, lysergic acid, it's used to make LSD, which is a pretty hardcore drug. So it's just, uh, it, it, this is really interesting to look up. Okay, so is LSD like technically natural? Technically, yeah. Comes from a natural source. <laughs> yeah. But LSD, think about all of the other, so you could have these like fun hallucinations, right? But could you also have like that and that as a result of it is the thing. Is that the dosing? I mean, with anything, dosing is like really important to know the dosage, and especially based on your weight and your metabolism, there's so much to know. And that's why um, recreational drugs are, uh, can be very dangerous, right? So you have to know all of these, these things. 